Welcome, it's This Is Going Well, I Think, with David Cooper. I'm your host, David Cooper. Who else would I be? It's This Is Going Well, I Think, the show where no one's listening, no one cares, the show where every episode's the last episode. Today, more of a slice of life show, kind of like a podcast, less like a radio show, which makes sense, because this is a podcast, I think. And today's been a very busy day for me. I put an offer in on a house, which has been super stressful. Buying a house in New York is almost impossible. So we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to bring on one of the great experts in buying homes in New York City. This guy is so specialized and has such amazing knowledge. He's going to walk me and hopefully you through the process. What's that you say being walked through the process of buying a home in a state that I probably don't live in is boring to you? Well, I promise this expert's so good, this is going to be anything but boring. But first, this. We are here with the world's foremost expert in New York home buying to advise me. This guy's a huge get. He charges $10,000 an hour just to give advice, but he's decided to do this show for free. He joins us now remotely on vacation as he's in the United Kingdom. Tony Five, welcome to the show. Yeah! I'm walking in. I'm buying a property here. A condominium, brother. I'm looking over Central Park and I'm looking at Madison and 4th and 5th and Wall Street. You buy, I sell. You come to my property, I let you in. I let it be my family's home. Yes is the answer to your question. Yeah, is that what real real estate agents sound like in America? Well, yeah, except they hold in one hand a pizza pie and the other Mm. hand, I don't Mm. know, a black and white cookie and on their head they Uh, wear a Yankees hat. Um, uh, African-American cookie, David, come on. Have you seen the Seinfeld about the black and white cookie? No. Oh my God, you couldn't put this out today, but Jerry becomes obsessed with the black and white cookie. It's basically a cake cookie, kind of like a pastry. Not an Oreo. No, and half of it is white icing and half of it is is black icing or chocolate icing. And Jerry says uh, all of humanity's like racial problems between the various peoples could be solved if they only learn the lesson of the cookie. And then yes. Jerry's in a bakery <laughs> buying a cookie and a black guy's eating the same cookie. And right. Jerry, Jerry gives him the nod and the black guy gives hit Jerry back nice. a nod. And then Jerry goes off on it saying two races of cookie living in perfect racial harmony. And it's just uh, and then anytime anything suggestive of racism, racism comes up in that episode, Jerry says, look to the cookie, Elaine, look to the cookie. Nice. It's, uh, that's it. That's- I, I guess he had to have been there. Yeah. I mean, it, it's funny, I guess. I guess. Again, yeah, he probably had to have been there. Had to so, be there. You know, when you say this is going well, I think, when do you think you'll know? <laughs> At, at what stage will you go from thinking about it to actually going, yeah, I know. I think on my deathbed, I'll be reflecting on a... a Do you cur- think those are going to be your last words? Tony, uh, uh, I know. And the key to all of my millions is... Uh, I don't think that'll happen. I think I'll reflect okay. on my career of radio and say, that did not go well. And now I know. Okay, fair enough. Do do you think on your deathbed, what would you, if you knew you were going to die tomorrow, like literally I said, right, David, this time tomorrow you're going to die, what would you do? I don't know. I'd probably put out an episode on my podcast. That's fucking great content. Carry on. I don't know. This is a talk show. I'm talking to you. Eh, I don't know. It was sort of a buying time before I answer, collect my thoughts. (laughs) I don't know. It wasn't a, I don't know period i don't know i think i would just put out an episode of my podcast i'd call my parents i'd make sure miranda was around i'd call a lot of my good friends and i'd see who was available for dinner i'd go to my favorite restaurant and then i still got 22 hours left and then i'd watch a great show at night in bed maybe have sex and and die the next day i mean what what are you gonna do still technically got about 20 hours left dude yeah (laughs) i'll have sex now i have 19 hours and 59 minutes left (laughs) exactly right so what would you like for the rest of the 20 would you stay awake would you try and go to sleep would you be too sort of like panicky to go to sleep would you want to live every moment and attempt to do things even though you knew it couldn't be done would you try and do one thing like completely illegal with no repercussions I I don't know, (sighs) kick somebody in Times Square and run off. I don't know. Like, would you would you do something so out of character because you knew you were going to die that you would just do it? Maybe I'd like to think I'd be real Zen and accepting 
My aunt uh-huh. had lung cancer when she was in her, I don't know, 40s. Wow. And then it I'm... came, it, she fought it. She went into remission and then it came back okay. in her mid 50s, early 60s. And she was done by the time she would, went back to the hospital and like she had a okay. couple months to live. And so I, I booked a ticket to, to Toronto and I visited yep. her. Okay. Um, and she was so zen, almost clairvoyant, so accepting. Really? She kept on saying, I'm going to die and it's okay. I'm really glad you came. I wanted to spend time with you before I died. And she was just like so accepting to almost to the point where she was freaking everyone out. Are you sure she was in the medication? No, I, I, I don't think at that time. <clears throat> Good radio content, clearing the throat. Oh, fantastic, David. I don't, th- I don't think at that time she was zonked on medication because she lived for a few more months after that. Wow. I think at the very end, sure, probably. But Were you close to her? No, not particularly, but she was my aunt. She was around a lot growing up. I wasn't. How did you feel when she was so zen about something that's so obviously final and... I cried. It was a nice... It, did you ever read that cheesy book, Tuesdays with Maury? No, I, I don't really like Tuesdays. I prefer Friday, if I'm honest, because you got the long weekend. Thursdays are all right. Uh, Tuesdays are a shit day. I hate you. <laughs> Carry on. Hey, it's this old professor. I don't even remember of what. It's said in, I think, Montreal. And his student, I don't know, really looked up to him and goes to work uh-huh. for him as he's dying. And, and he sits down with this professor and writes his life lessons before he dies. And it's kind of sweet. And it's a really nice... It's a real tearjerker, a real feel-good tearjerker. Anyway, it kind of felt like that a bit. Like, there, she wasn't upset. You know, she was just happy that I made the trip to see her before she died. But I, I'd like to think that if I found out I was dying tomorrow, I would be like my aunt. Just very accepting and warm and just really grateful, you know? There, there is an element of acceptance, I guess. And I do envy people that have that wonderful like you said maybe zen maybe calmness maybe like knowing well it's inevitable right i could scream and shout and cry and punch and whatever but i'm still gonna die or i can just accept. and there are people that really want to be horrible about it and can be nasty and can fight and you know use their last hours or days or weeks or months to kind of point out how horrible people are i've seen that happen as well to people but i don't know i'd like to think i would go out in an absolute blaze of glory like what you would go to buckingham palace and demand to be let in what what's tony five's blaze of glory yeah something that i would be at least newsworthy but not newsworthy in a kind of horrible i wouldn't like kill anybody but i would do something like I don't know. I would attempt to climb like Big Ben, knowing that I physically can't climb Big Ben. And there would just be videos of me trying to scale this thing. And then everybody come up to me. I'd be saying, look, I'm dying. Just let me have a go like that. And I think that would be pretty cool. Or, you know, getting ready as if I was going to run like the New York or London Marathon and just die midway. (laughs) <laughs> knowing that I was going to die, because that would be awesome. Like, and I'd be remembered forever as man died midway through London Marathon. Do you know what I mean? I, I wouldn't want to be remembered as Tony Five. Uh, man did. You mm-hmm. know, like that's the title of the article that I'm in. Man does. Well, how long is a flight to Florida? Because I feel like you could be the ultimate Florida man. I'll, I'd be like the imported Florida man, right? Man from England goes to Florida to die. Florida Englishman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, see, I'm kind of obsessed with. Have you heard of the? Have you heard of these mysteries? There's a guy called the Summerton Man. Have you heard of this? No, go ahead. So, the Summerton Man is very. It is these sort of untold mysteries. So, in the 19, I think it was after the war, 1940s. Uh, cut a long story short, a man was found on a beach in America, Summerton Beach, in Australia. Sorry, in Summerton Beach, sitting stark upright. He had a suit on and. He died, right? So they found a body and they tried to identify. Couldn't identify him. So just an unknown man in a suit on a beach, dead in Australia. On a beach, quite a hot day, correct. And then the thing started getting even bigger. So when they did this autopsy, they see that they couldn't work out how he died. He just died, right? They couldn't, there was no tox results or whatever. And then they looked for identification. Every single one of his clothing tags had been ripped off, taken off, right? 
And so there, for like 60, 70 years, nobody has been able to identify this man. And there are theories that he was a Cold War spy or that he was assassinated. And it's wonderful. It's this wonderful story. But there was such a, like, for example, they did this forensics on him and they saw that he had really um, uh, pronounced calves. So almost like a runner or a ballet dancer. So there was all this assumption that this guy was super fit or maybe he was a runner. Again, they, they did all searches all around the world. This is before DNA. So it was all done in the, the state of the art at the time. It's called the Summerton Man. You can Google it as I talk about it. And it is absolutely fascinating. So I'd want to be like that. So the, the moral of, in that Summerton Man thing, and this was what was so good, they went through his clothing and there was a tiny bit of paper that was rolled up and it said on it, Tamam should, which is... The, and so it ends or and so it in finishes and this is from like a hundred year old book called the rubicon of omar khayyam which again is a really rare book and that he torn it out so this mystery was compounded with another fascinating mystery and they tried to search for this guy and then months later someone had, who had parked their convertible on the front of the beach had found this book with this page taken out of it so obviously now they're going backwards that this man had walked along thrown this book in um and then they tried then there was loads of these scribblings and numbers in the back of the book so they found it was a number then they went to this number and it was this woman's house right so they said to this woman do you know this guy they showed a picture of him his um his corpse his, his death mask death faith and she took her an audible gasp and it looked to everybody concerned that she knew this guy but she never said she did. And she held this secret with her through her family, her daughter, her daughter's daughter, her daughter's daughter's daughter. And then it came out that she might possibly have been a spy in the war. Um, and she'd kept it tight because she'd spoken Russian. It's, it's fascinating. And if any of the listeners are interested, it's called the Google the Summerton Man. And it's absolutely, it's just a fascinating story. And the moral of the story is, I want to be the modern day Summerton man, David. We're going to come back with Tony Five in just a moment. We're here with Tony Five, the Summerton man. Tony, you want to tell us quickly what the Summerton man is? So it's, it's just an, an endearing mystery of of a man who was found um sitting upright on a beach and they, they couldn't identify him for years nearly a hundred years and there were so many weird things clues about him like uh, he'd been sat the night before and his arm had been raised and people had walked past him thinking that he was waving at them and some guys who were running around at the beach and when they found him they obviously you know realized he was dead they did the autopsy couldn't work out how he died like whether it had been a heart attack or stroke or, or poisoning or anything and it, this story has gone from you know from absolutely you know sensible and and, and serene to like completely all right like this guy was a spy and he was murdered by the rock and so there are a couple of things that i really like so one of them is that the second thing is called the isdal mystery where a group of these teenagers climbed this norwegian um, mountain fjord where the snow is and they were all really fit whatever and they found these guys afterwards semi-naked with parts of their bodies torn out and ripped out but they couldn't work out why so you know there's all these theories it was like a yeti or whatever or how what happened did they turn well, on each other there's paradox paradoxismal paradoxical undressing which i know is a symptom of severe hypothermia uh, so yes, when you're right. freezing to death ripping off your clothes is actually not that uncommon however pieces of flesh torn out is, is uncommon so they couldn't work out why how did it happen you know was it animals that had eaten them afterwards but people didn't know and it's one of the things that i so i think the latest on that one which is called the isdal uh no no it's not called it's called it sorry i'm lying that's another one this is called the diatlov pass mystery so if you google diatlov that's the diatlov that's where the group of teenagers or whatever so go on i guess the wider thing is and the thing we were talking about before the break if you had 24 hours to live what would you do you want to be part of some great unsolved mystery is what you're saying yeah or i'd create a treasure map that had no ending but everybody would look for it for at least the next five years <laughs> it's fucking insane i mean i absolutely insane i would definitely do that you said 
before the break that you would go up to Big Ben and try to scale it to get all the media yes. attention. But I feel like you would just make it to the side of the building. You, you wouldn't be able to get any higher than that. So Correct. The, the thing would be man stands next to Big Ben. I don't think that would make national Well, it news. would look like I was trying to mount Big Ben, to be fair. Ma- I keep running into it. Man <laughs> tries to mount Big Ben man before demands, he dies. Man demands marriage to Big Ben. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I wouldn't want to, because obviously everything is so uh, tense here in, well, in the world at the moment. So I doing anything Thing, even slightly dangerous, threatening criminal would end up in me getting shot. That's and and everybody gets in shot the every UK, day. UK though, yeah, it's really bad at the moment. Oh, the, with all the, the UK that police the are wars, getting trigger happy, like the American police. They are getting police? trigger happy, dude. Yeah, they are. It's uh, very very trigger happy at the moment. I thought so, they just carry a stick to beat up minorities with. I thought they don't have guns. Well, they do that, but they just point with it now, which is really even weirder. Now they come along with a taser and a gun and they shoot you and then run away. But don't most cops not have arms in the UK? Yeah, the majority to, don't have. They have we to have radio the calls units. with the machine guns. They have to be like, oh, come, Correct. come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come along and shoot the black guy. Yeah. So it's kind of like, um, I don't know. What else would be epic? Maybe I'd try and, like, I don't know, get a hot air balloon and try and fly it over London. That's probably been done before now. But not without permission and not with a dying bald man. That's true. That's true. You could, you could do some weird stunt. In the sky. Maybe construct a blimp? A zeppelin? I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, let, let's be honest. I've only got 20 hours. So sure. we have to balance what I can do with Amazon it, Prime. Yeah, 30 hours is the minimum for building a zeppelin, for sure. Correct, yeah. yeah. So whatever I can get to build with on Amazon Prime, plus getting down to London in traffic, it's probably about an hour and a half. So conservatively, let's give me 16 hours to do something epic before I die. It's kind of like the question, what would you do if you won the $100 billion lottery or something like that? And I I guess my answer to what would you do if you had 24 hours to live is I just try to have a really good normal day. Just like if I won the lottery back when I had my day job, I would go to work the next day because you don't want to cause too much disruption to your life. But if you only have 24 hours to live, maybe disruption is not such a bad thing. With $100 I would... That's a different question for me completely. I would spend every minute of every day helping people. I would think it would give me the most amount of pleasure and beauty. Everywhere I would go, I would try my best um, using that money for good. I I buy people meals, take people out, listen to people, listen to people's problems, listen to people's anxieties and try and resolve just one. There are some things I can't buy. I can't buy someone's health. I can't buy someone's love. I can't buy someone's security. But I can give them a little bit of faith and hope in humanity and that money will give me the key to that. You can do that now, though. I've got about $7 in my pocket, David. (laughs) I just mean you can volunteer, you can, and you do do those things. Oh, but I do do, I do do that, yeah. yeah. But I miss, I mean, I just would, with that hundred billion that you said, my God, it would be amazing. Like immediately to mind, I don't think of the Russian models, the super yachts, the fast cars. No. I think of just purely the amount of like, I just fly you over and I'd fly me over to you and I'd build us a studio and I'd do this podcast where nobody listens, but in a really nice environment. Yeah, that'd be nice. nice. You know, or or, or really just be like every other person in the media industry and pay for us to be famous. Like pay Jimmy Fallon to interview us or yeah, whatever. With a hundred billion, we could do anything, right? How much would it cost to force Jimmy Fallon? I would, I would want Jimmy Kimmel or Stephen Colbert, but regardless. I like him. Colbert's nice. I mean, how, I don't know. How, how much, much but I guess the question us? is how much could you pay to do a late night, late night appearance for no good reason when you're a nobody like us? I mean, how amazing would that be? We just pay this guy off millions, right? And say, look, we want to be on your show. We're not very good, but we've got loads of money. And you're going to introduce us as two up and coming radio hosts. <laughs> Up and coming by their own lottery winnings. By their own lottery win, yeah. Not by merit, but by money. I mean, there are examples of extremely wealthy, well-connected actors and musicians who kind of just get their way bought in. Yeah. Like, I really like this artist, Lana Del Rey. She, I love, I love her. I well, think she's brilliant. She's only now getting accolades. But when she first entered the scene, I think her dad, some rich, I don't know what. And she got a lot of flack for being just her dad bought her career. Same with um, oh. the, um, the, the, the Strokes. Um, really? 
Yeah, I think. Is that the name of the band? It's Julian Casablanca's? Yeah, yeah. But I didn't know. Lana Del Rey, she's got an amazing, soulsy, I know. very ethereal voice. I think she, she sang on The um, Great Gatsby. And I, that's one of my favorite songs that she sang on The Great Gatsby. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, this is all allegedly. I'm, this is like word of mouth. I Ooh. haven't done the research into Lana Del Rey or Julian Casablanca's. But as I understand it, their parents kind of bought their way into the music oh. industry. But they also had the talent. And so yeah. they got a lot of flack for being Nepo babies, you know. Nep- I've heard that. I've heard that example, uh, but I only ever heard it with actors, actors and actresses, kids who well, are. For who, me, who I'm, I'm kind of like Alfred Hitchcock when it comes to acting. I think actors are cattle, and it's who cares, you know. <laughs> really? Well, no, actually, I do think acting takes great talent, but I just mean like I don't really care about actors and actresses. I, I when I'm moved by a piece, it's the work, not not necessarily the portrayal. Yeah. Most of the time. But for music, I'm moved by the artists themselves. And so when an artist gets their first album launched, you know, because their father or mother cut them yeah. a $10 million check and put them on the billboards and forced the record <laughs> industry to put up their... And bought that, all the albums to get them up there, yeah. That's when I notice. I'm not saying it doesn't happen in acting, but for me, that's when I notice. Uh, Having okay, said okay, that... Okay. I think Lana Del Rey's got a beautiful voice, a wonderful. And she's a stunning looking woman as well. She's yeah. amazing. Yeah, she's got everything. I, I don't, I couldn't even pick her out of a lineup, but I'm, you know, maybe really? she's stunning. Yeah, I don't know what she Have looks look, like. I know, what she, her now. I know what she sounds like. Uh, Lana yeah. Del Rey. Naked. <laughs> I mean, she's, I, I can see why you'd like her. Yeah, she's very pretty. And she's got, like I said, this amazing voice. But to be honest with you, I've not seen any interviews with her. And now, now that you mention it, why isn't she more popular? Maybe there is a bit of hatred against her. Well, her most recent album that got put out not too long ago got massive accolades. So she's kind of getting that, that the okay, accolades now. You know, people aren't just saying, oh, you you know, whatever. You're, you're, uh, you're, uh, what's the word? Nepo singer. Nepo singer. Yeah, she's beat Lana Del Rey. Yeah, I'm looking at her. She's only 38. Yeah. I'm looking up her parents and it says her father yeah, is just Yeah, I can't a... see. Now I'm like. Now I'm fascinated by that, that you said, because her name's not even Del Rey, which is, yeah, vintage Hollywood. That's what I, I was trying to get that. She's like the Hollywood vintage glamour aesthetic, which is great. Yeah. Wow. But it doesn't say anything about, does it say about her? Her kind of, oh God, she's, she did it when she was in college and stuff like that. She's got an amazing voice. But yeah, anyway. I'm I'm uh, I'm surprised. I mean, it's it's a shame. My mum's just like a crackhead. Otherwise, uh, we could have got her to pay for something. <laughs> Let's get her deported. All right, Tony. We had uh, we went deep. We went wide. We went really, really, really smooth down the hole of radio. And that's my uh, Tinder name, David. I believe it, Tony. Thank you. Always a pleasure. All right, continuing the slice of life conversational style that we got going on today, I'm going to bring on my friend, comedian Natalie Norman, who's Toronto based, to discuss ghosting. Hinge, the dating app, has found a way to ban ghosting to defeat what they call dating burnout. We'll get Natalie Norman's expert dating opinion on that in a moment. And we are back with This Is Going Well, I Think, with David Cooper. I rarely say the name of the show in the introduction. I'm here with comedian Natalie Norman to do a well-produced segment on ghosting. Natalie, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I've been ghosted a lot. Is that why you brought me on? Uh, No, I brought you on because I like you and I just shoot the shit with you on the show. But my producer is like... You got to have some content. You got to have some direction. I usually say no, but she sent us an article to go over. So we're going to try that. Why not? Yeah. Neither of us read the article. Well, I did ask a AI bot to summarize the article for me. Okay. So what's the summary? I feel like such a nerd even saying that on the show. Well, who cares? You are a nerd. True. The article's titled Mm -hmm. Hinge finds a way to ban ghosting on app to defeat dating burnout. And they're trying to focus on quality over quantity. And how are they doing that? How do you do that? There's a new feature. It's called Turn Your Limits. Excuse me, Your Turn Limits. Uh, And it's supposed to address dating app fatigue. The feature limits unanswered questions and prompts users to either... My dyslexia is really... (laughs) I should have read this before... (laughs) This feature limits unanswered messages and prompts users to either respond to or end conversations before starting new ones. 
I don't, does that... Oh, that's still not going to prevent real life ghosting, though. I think you have to like enable it. And so you won't talk to people who ghost or it won't let you ghost or I don't even know. I think it's like the idea is that basically if you're not if you'll see this conversation and then like before you can start talking to a new match. Yeah. You have to say, am I going to continue talking to this person or end it? So you can't just have a, a million matches to boost your ego and just leave them there sitting. Exactly. Interesting. What do you make of that? I make like, sure. Great. Good feature. Who cares? Like the ghosting doesn't like to me, ghosting doesn't happen until you've started talking off the app. Or they're just like, hey, you seem cool. And then they don't respond when you respond to that. Yeah, that's not ghosting, though. That's that's the problem. Ghosting like if we're talking on the app and you disappear. Oh, well, we haven't met in real life. Ghosting happens. When like we've been talking in real life, we've gone on a date and then you disappear and there's no way to prevent that. I agree. Let's talk about ghosting. Let's forget Hinge and this stupid thing. Yeah. I, have a, I have a friend, sexual health and consent educator, Samantha Biddy. She'll be on the show tomorrow. She says ghosting is a form of, I, I don't want to misquote her, but like yeah. sexual violence. You know, she thinks ghosting is akin to you know, if someone has sex with you and then they ghost you, you wouldn't have consented to the sex in the first place knowing they would ghost you. I agree with this. And it's because I think unless you've been ghosted like this, you don't understand how actually traumatic it is. And I don't like to use the word traumatic. Like there's obviously a lot more going on, a lot more things that are more traumatic, but it's really hard to deal with. You're like, what did I do? Was I bad in bed? Was the person using me? Like, it's not okay. And my rule of thumb is like, if I sleep with you and I don't like you or something happened, I will always let you know. Like, I will never just disappear on someone because it, I, at the end of the day, still respect the person. Otherwise, why would I sleep with them? So you can cut off contact is what you're saying, but you should at least text you saying, hey, N Natalie, the chemistry wasn't there. I'm not really interested in going out again. Is that fine? Well, you don't, that's fine. But like, you don't even have to say that unless the person contacts you like. Sometimes you have two people like have sex and both of them just don't like it and never contact each other again. Mutual that's ghosting. Not, that's fine. Mutual. Well, I don't even think that's ghosting. It's just like, you know, there was like an understanding. It's when say like I slept with someone, I didn't like it. And then he's like, should we go out again? And I can be like, sorry, I didn't feel it. That's when you have to say something when they are like vying for your attention. It's like, don't leave them hanging. It's unnecessary. You're an adult. If you're an adult enough to have sex, you can also say, I don't like you and I don't want to have sex. So implicit in the kind of, I mean, it makes it very unsexy, but implicit in the contract, when you sleep with someone, you're basically saying, if you are going to cut it off with me when I message you after we sleep together, you at least have to cut it off with me. You can't just ignore me. Yeah, and I don't think that's unsexy. I think that's just common decency. No, no, me referring to it as a contract yeah. is unsexy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's like, but that's like, we're always in social contracts in this life. And like, to me, I can't understand how you could like, like, my thing is like, if you put your fingers in me, you better, and I message you again, you better get back to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really bad at getting back to people, but I don't put my fingers in a lot of people, Natalie. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. I'm talking about like, you put your fingers in me, you, in my mouth. Okay. And you can't text me back. Are your fingers broken? <laughs> <laughs> And if they are broken, that's a good reason. Sure. Get a, we have voice to note, you know? That is true. It's not very good. You'd think with all this chat AI, I mean, I guess AI summarized the article for us. This text, to, I'm constantly getting weird texts from people and then they say, oh, sorry, I was dictating it. Yeah, well, which is crazy. Just like if you, if you really can't dictate, like if you don't have the time, take a minute and sit down and write back. But like ghosting is such an interesting thing to me because people like, if you're on the app and you don't get back to me, we didn't ha we don't know each other. So you actually don't have a problem with leaving a ton of people hanging after that initial match. Well, it's not it's not even hanging. It's like we're all like the understanding is that we're all talking to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Right. Like you're not going to ke have chemistry with everyone. Maybe you'll like realize that you didn't like something about the conversation and then that's it. Like it's fine. I like to delete people when I decide I don't like them. Just to close the page. Just a close the page so they know that this is not for me. And people do that to me because I'm on field and field. And we'll even like inform you. They'll be like, this person left the chat. And you're like, OK. Isn't it kind of a bad experience? I mean, not everyone is a, is a match magnet like you are, Natalie. 
I'm sure there's people who are uggos out there who they're getting, they might get a match or two and then no one ever responds. Maybe they're just trying to clean up that experience. Sure. But if like people aren't responding to you, people aren't responding to you. Like it's like, sure. Then they respond to you. And this is just a faster way of you not knowing that someone's not interested. Miranda, my girlfriend likes when I say if we break up, but let's be honest here, when we break up, how do you think okay. I'm going to do on the apps? Like I haven't been on an app in 10 years. The last app I was on was Tinder when it was first launched, you know, like so, when it first hit the market. Is that when you, where you met Miranda? Yeah, that's where I met Miranda and the times we broke up. I, I don't know. I just didn't, I didn't app it. I, I slept with a couple people, but it was through friends we met or, you know, who knows. How we I don't, met. I don't, first of all, think that the two of you are breaking up. So let, let's start She's there. She's going to dump me eventually. Let's be honest. I don't think she will. I think she loves you so much. Oh my God. And she like jokes about it. And I don't think she could live her life without your crazy ass. So that's the first thing. Second of all, I don't think you would join the apps. You're not an app person. Some people are just inherently not app people. And in fact, what I've noticed is more people are off the apps now. But who's going to sleep meeting? with me? If, I, if they meet me in person, they're not going to like me. Like me, at least with an app, there's, they don't have to hear my annoying voice for the first five minutes. Yeah, but then they, oh, that's my most jarring thing on the apps is when I have to meet, like I'm talking to someone and I have an idea of what their voice is in my head. And by the way, the voice is always my voice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It, so then I hear their voice and I'm like, oh, no, I don't want to go out with this person. I was talking about AI. It keeps coming up. I guess it's just the thing we're going to talk about for the next hundred years. I was talking about AI porn with someone. The other Ew. day and like depicting semi illegal acts and should you be allowed to do that and this, that and the other, who cares? But I'm just thinking when AI porn finally gets good, you're just going to generate you with a male version of you and then watch it. Why would I do that? That's not my, why I like porn. Oh, well, I was just trying to make a play on the voice thing is all. Okay. Well, yeah, like, well, f well the voice thing's psycho. Look, like, I, I was trying to, to make something funny. It was a dead <laughs> end. We throw things at the wall. That one didn't stick. Let's move on. Okay. Okay. How am I going to date? How do people date these days if they're not on the I apps? Don't, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm having a really hard time. Like, I'm on the apps. I've been banned from two. I've snuck back onto them. And if anyone's curious how you sneak back on Hinge, you just got to buy an alternative phone number. <laughs> <laughs> it costs four dollars a month easy peasy did you actually do that yeah they you, kicked me off for what well so there's a few things originally i thought it was because i created a fake profile and when i say a fake profile i was curious to see what my competition was like like the other women out there and the reason i also was curious is because i'd gone on a date with a guy and he told me that every woman on hinge is looking to get married and i was like that can't be true and he was wrong. It wasn't that. What I did discover is there's a lot of women with filters on, like butterfly filters. And I thought that was strange. But someone reported me. What's a but butterfly that, filter? Like, you know, on Instagram, you could put like butterflies floating on your face. I don't even know what that means. But no, like a like a, a visual filter, like a like a yeah. picture, a filter on the picture. Yeah. Ah, all right. Which is so, so bizarre. And then what I found out is that if you restart your count, too many times they think you're a bot. So they thought you were a bot. We're going to come back with, it, go, go ahead. No, no, go to commercial break. <laughs> it's not commercial break yet, but it's getting into that format in the hopes that it might be someday. Oh, okay, okay. We're here with Natalie Norman, comedian from Toronto, talking about ghosting, ostensibly. Yeah. We are back with comedian Natalie Norman, based out of Toronto, but spends a lot of time in New York. Natalie, welcome back. And when are you coming back to New York? I'm coming um, next week. For what? Uh, I got things to do there. No, you don't. <laughs> yeah, I do. Should I come to your apartment and use it as my podcast studio so I can record some episodes with my friends? I was thinking about that. It looks so cool. Like my, I got a nice apartment and I could do a video podcast, but I, I, I end up just taping it at my ugly desk in my ugly office room. Yeah, it's crazy. Your apartment is like stunning and it's got beautiful light and you have all the equipment. It's, cr it's crazy because you could technically rent out your spare room like if you wanted to. And I don't think you want to because you don't love people in your no, space. No. But you could could rent that out. It was like you could have had your own podcast like network by now. Wow. 
Well, maybe I'm looking to buy a new house. It hasn't been going well. I've been on the market for seven or eight months now, but maybe in my new house, I can make something like that. Yeah, we're waiting. Speaking of not liking people in my space, you cat sat for me. And I was a little worried about it because you're aloof, you're wild, you have a lot of sex. But I think because you're so neurotic and because you've never owned a cat, you were actually a great cat sitter because you were like worried. You told me that you went to some guy's house and you were going to have sex and maybe spend the night. And then you told him, I can't spend the night. I can't be late. I got to get home to the cat to feed him. Whereas my other friend who you've met, Tracy, who yeah. is my cat sitter, she cat sits professionally. So she knows these animals. So she knows she can f off to Long Island for 48 hours and, you know, give him a little extra food and he'll be fine. It's not great, but, you know, I, and I appreciated it. Well, first off, I'm not sleeping with anyone in Long Island. That's way too far for me. <laughs> okay, let's start with that. Like, that was insulting. Like, there's a guy in Staten Island. I know it's not the same. Who keeps on being like, we should go out. And I was like, you have to drive to me. No, that's not happening. But I've cast it before. And the thing is, like, your cat is very needy. And I didn't want to leave her, him, him, tomato by himself because he would have cried. Yeah, he is very needy. He's very needy. And your apartment's nicer than any man's apartment I would ever sleep in. <laughs> I feel like if I lived in a much worse apartment, that would still be true. But hey, here we are. Yeah, I don't know. I just think it's like your cat sitting. It's like, sure, you can leave a cat for 24 hours, 48 hours. But like, it's also you don't need to. No, you don't need to. And like your cat, like most cats are very needy for the most part. Like your cat wants to sit on you. You wants to slap your face. It wants to put its paws in your stomach and scratch you. <laughs> it's called doing biscuits. Yeah. Doing me. He's kneading my tummy. Needing. I've never, my tits have never been beat up so much. <laughs> <laughs> are you into that? No. And I was like, get off me, tomato. Like we were starting to get in a fight. Wow. He was packing your boobs back into your, I don't know, rib cage. Yeah, it was tough. Uh, we were talking about dating somehow. Okay. So apps, you hinge, but your favorite app is, is uh, Field, no? So the reason I like Field is because I think there's an understanding that like you have to be completely transparent on it because you're into like, it is for sex and, you know, it's for like kinks and not everyone's like super kinky on there, but I do think there's this natural tendency to be like very honest, like be like, I'm looking for casual. This is what I like. This is what I don't like. And if you're not, it's not working out. They have that feature where you like leave the conversation and it's done. So kinky people question for you. Are there a lot of boring, basic heteronormative, just like vanilla cookie cutter couples on there looking for their ideal threesome partner who probably doesn't exist because they're so picky and that kind of thing. I don't know if the couples that are like looking for a threesome are necessarily the pickiest. I wouldn't say they're the pickiest. I would say they're the least attractive. Like there's <laughs> very rarely a couple where I'm like, wow, that's a really good looking couple. Like sometimes there's one partner. Usually there's one partner who's better, way better looking than the other. Mm hmm. Um, and I, and I, they're usually not very heteronormative. If I'm going to say that, like, usually like both partners are bi. Okay. So it's a, what if, what if the guy was just busted up, ugly dude, he's with a supermodel and they're, they're listed looking for a, a lady to have a threesome with. Well, have you ever seen anything like that? Of course. And it goes both ways. Like there's everything on there. What I will say is that like a lot of people are just like, really don't know how to hold a conversation or like paint a picture or like. You know, like, even though it's like straightforward, they can be a little a little more nuances, in my opinion, from some of these people. Play a little, you know, have a little fun with it. Yeah. Like sometimes people are like, you want to see my dick right away? And I'm like, no, like, <laughs> at no, least like, send me three messages first. But it's like, oh, yeah, at least be like, hi, who are you? Like, uh, you know, I like the amount of dick pics I have now on this phone is like astronomical. It's like I could do a full hundred picture gallery of dicks you should do a dick collage on your wall no i don't want that i don't want that i, I i'm already scarred enough some i saw one this week some guy sent me and it was like too big it was like 12 inches jesus are you sure and I'm it, like it wasn't like uh you know a filter a butterfly filter as it were even if it is a filter i was like i don't want to talk to this guy this too is much. not getting in me yeah it's too not going much. in me yeah it's just it's too much of a good thing not a good thing but here's another thing it's like people are like I think it's dependent on the city. People are really hard to get to meet in person. Like Toronto, it's really hard to get someone to meet you in person. People just want to chit chat forever. 
New York, it's a lot quicker to the point where it's like so quick that like you miss your window, you miss your window. Yeah. The guy upstairs who lives in my building, I think is playing the field on the app, if you will. Like I, I, he's got a different girl every night. Yeah. And that's what I mean. Like some people are like, let's get in there. Let's get out. Like new person, new person. Like it's, it's interesting. And there's a new app. There's a new app. What is it? It's called Thursdays. My friend told me about it. And the idea is on Thursday, you are invited to an event to meet people, single people in IRL. So it's just like meetup.com, but for dating and only on Thursday? Yeah. Like they have an event every Thursday in your city and you kind of like find out the day of. And I think when you get there, you get people like numbers. And then if you match with someone, you're a match on the app. I feel like they should just, after the event, everyone at the event has a little profile and you can match with them by searching through who is there, no? But th that's what I'm saying. Okay. That's what it is. Yeah. It's not a bad idea. No, I think it's good because I think it's like a big problem. Like for me, like you, you're like going on a date and you meet the person you're like, oh my God, this is who I agreed to go out with. <laughs> well, I, and I think a lot of people are on there because they're bored or curious or think they might want to date, and, but then they don't really, you know, they, uh, it's, I got to meet them in person and my photos look way better than I do. And I was so much younger when this was photo was taken. And ah, what if they know that I smell or, you know, that I'm, a, you know, there's social anxiety. Like I think a lot of people when you're chatting, it's much, it, it's fine to get that attention. And in their mind, they think they might want to go on that date. But then when it comes down to it, for whatever reason, they back out. Yeah, it's waste. It, online is safer. It is safer, like for your, me like physically, mentality, whatever, everything. But, you know, I'm curious, where do people meet people in IRL? I don't know. Otherwise, a cornfield, a hardware store, crochet okay. class, anywhere. Yeah, like a place that me and you are going to. I've been to a cornfield before. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I see you probably went to the cornfield. You're like, I can't handle this and turned around. No, there's bugs. There's dirt. Exactly. No, I'm not doing that. It's hot. You know. I've seen on TikTok, there'll be like a girl will be like five best bars in New York to meet someone in real life. And? Well, I never, I've never, I never go anywhere when I'm in New York. I've never been to Central Park. See, this is why, <laughs> we'll get to that in a second, which I find <laughs> hilarious. Uh, this is why I should be on TikTok so I could find what those top five bars are to meet someone IRL. And those would be my top five bars to never go to. Well, that's, you get on TikTok. We're all on it. I know. I will. Th my show, you're going to love this. We have an intern incoming. Don't ask. Of course. <laughs> he just graduated from a broadcasting program at Seneca in, in near Toronto. Um, but he's going to help me with TikTok. Now, forget about that. Don't care about TikTok. You've been to New York how many times? Like, how many cumulative days have you spent in the greater New York area in your life? It's so embarrassing. Well, up until last February, I'd only been to New York twice. Oh. So it's this year that I like February and then I was at your place for like three or four weeks. So I would say probably like three months, maybe three months. All right. Never I, been to Central Park. Are you ready to hear the list of places I've never been? I love it. Uh, yes, I'm so ready. I've never been to Central Park. I've never been to any museum. So not, <laughs> so not the MoMA, like not. Have you been things. outside any of these museums? No. So have you not been to like uptown ever? I've I've been to Harlem once. It was beautiful. I mean, that's not uptown. That's past uptown. I mean, it is oh. in uptown, but I'm talking like Upper East Side, Central Park South. I've, I've walked through um, the Upper West Side. Okay. I've walked through at night from Harlem. I walked, me and my friend walked like 40 blocks. Okay, so but you probably walked past the Natural History Museum. Not that I remember. But the, isn't the park right there when you're walking? No, no, no. I didn't walk through the park. I didn't even walk by the park. You walked through the Upper West Side. Is the whole Upper West Side in the park? No, it's to the uh, west of the park. <laughs> okay, keep so, going. Next next thing on the list. Like, I've never been to, like, a botanical garden. I've never been to, like, any of the well-known restaurants. I've never been to, like, Magnolia, which is, like, crazy. Have I you been cakes. to Times Square? Yeah, I go to Times Square all the time. Oh, I wish I'd never been. <laughs> Have you been to a musical or a show? Never been. You've to never been to a show. I've been to, when I was, like, the first time I went to New York, I think I saw Stomp. Okay, so you've been to one show, fine. Yeah, but that's like 20 years Empire ago. Empire State Building, Chrysler no, Building, World Trade no, Center. No. Oh, I went to the World Trade Center uh, in September. <laughs> when was September 11th? Uh, 2001. 
I went there in October 2001. <laughs> oh, so you saw the hole. You saw the pit. You saw the, the crash site. Uh, yeah, and you know what I remember from it? Century 21, which is an old clothing store that I don't think exists anymore. Statue of Liberty? No. And you know what's even crazier? I've only been to Canal Street like three or four times. Ever taken a ferry? Uh, any kind no. of boat? No. I love it. So I'm going to, my goal is when I'm there this summer, I'm going to see at least one museum. So whatever you recommend. Yeah. Uh, MoMA. 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 Is that your favorite? Yeah, it's my favorite. You're not the museum of sex? Uh, I mean, that's like kitschy. It's, yeah. It's not like a real museum, yeah, not, eh? Yeah. Not a real museum. So I'll do MoMA and then one park. Any suggestion? A central or prospect. I've been, I've actually been to McCarran Park. Okay which is not one of the famous ones. It's kind of just like a field. Okay. And I've been to Prospect, like close to Prospect. <laughs> Natalie Norman, Toronto-based comedian. You can find her at stalkingnatalie.com. That's S-T-A-L-K-I-N-G. Natalie, what a pleasure. Thank you. That's a wrap on the show. Wish me good luck with the house stuff, and I'll be back tomorrow. Thank you for listening, as always. Mwah!